25 years of research has examined how drug abuse begins and how it progresses. Many factors can add to a person's risk for drug abuse. Risk factors can increase a person's chances for drug abuse, while protective factors can reduce the risk. It's important to note that most teens at risk for drug abuse do not start using drugs or become addicted, and a risk factor for one adolescent may not be for another. Risk and protective factors affect kids at different stages of their lives. At each stage, risks occur that can be changed through intervention. Early childhood risks, such as aggressive behavior, can be altered with family, school, and community interventions that focus on helping kids acquire developmentally healthy behaviors. If not addressed, problem behaviors can potentiate other risks, such as academic failure and social difficulties. Vicious cycles can develop, which then place kids at further risk for later drug abuse. Teen treatment programs should intervene as early as possible in the youth's development to solve problems as they come up and strengthen protective factors before problem behaviors exacerbate. Risk and protective factors affect people in five domains or settings. Think of these as locales where interventions can take place. Risk factors can influence drug taking in several ways. The more risks a teen is exposed to, the more likely that teen will use drugs. Some risk factors may be more powerful than others, and risk influence varies by developmental period. Peer influence during the teenage years is an example. But at the same time, protective factors such as a strong parenting relationship and parental monitoring practices, for instance, can have an offsetting or buffering influence. Interventions aim to change the balance between risk and protective factors. For example, treatment can facilitate or mobilize individual and family strengths or protective factors. The forces unleashed by interventions should crowd out and eventually outweigh risk factors. Are there early signs of risk that may predict later drug abuse? Some signs of risk can be seen as early as infancy or early childhood, such as aggressive behavior, lack of self-control, or difficult temperament. As the child gets older, interactions with family, at school, and within the community can heighten that child's risk for later substance abuse. Children's earliest interactions occur in the family, Sometimes family situations heighten a child's risk for later drug abuse. Examples would be when there is a lack of attachment and nurturing by parents or caregivers, ineffective parenting, and a parent who abuses drugs. But families can provide protection from later drug abuse when there is a development enhancing parenting relationship, parental investment and involvement in the teen's life, and clear limits and consistent enforcement of developmentally appropriate discipline. Interactions outside the family can involve risks for both children and adolescents, such as poor classroom behavior or social skills, academic failure, and association with drug abusing peers. Association with drug abusing peers is often the most proximal risk for exposing teens to drug abuse and delinquent behavior. Other factors, such as drug availability, trafficking patterns, and beliefs that drug abuse is generally tolerated are risks that can influence young people to start abusing drugs. What are the highest risk periods for drug abuse among youth? Research indicates that the key risk periods for drug abuse are during major transitions in children's lives. The first big transition for children is when they leave the security of the family and enter school. Later, when they advance from elementary to middle school, they often experience new academic and social situations, such as learning to get along with a wider group of peers. It's at this stage, early adolescence, that children are likely to encounter drugs for the first time. Entering high school, teens face additional social, emotional, and educational challenges. At the same time, they may be exposed to greater availability of drugs, drug abusers, and social activities involving drugs. These challenges can increase the risk that they will abuse alcohol, tobacco, and other substances. Studies indicate that some children are already abusing drugs at age 12 or 13, which likely means that some begin even earlier. Early abuse often includes such substances as tobacco, alcohol, inhalants, marijuana, and prescription drugs, such as sleeping pills and anti-anxiety medicines. 
If drug abuse persists into later adolescence, abusers typically become more heavily involved with marijuana and then advance to other drugs while continuing their abuse of tobacco and alcohol. Studies have also shown that abuse of drugs in late childhood and early adolescence is associated with greater drug involvement. It is important to note that most youth, however, do not progress to abusing other drugs. Scientists have proposed various explanations of why some individuals become involved with drugs and then escalate to abuse. One explanation points to biological factors, such as having a family history of drug or alcohol abuse. Another explanation is that abusing drugs often includes affiliation with drug abusing peers, which in turn exposes the individual to other drugs. Researchers have found that youth who rapidly increase their substance abuse have high levels of risk factors with low levels of protective factors. Gender, race, and community or neighborhood factors can also play a role in how and when kids begin using drugs. Using a risk and protective factor framework, clinicians assess multiple areas. Here are examples of key questions to guide your clinical assessment. What's happening in the family? Who lives in the home? Have there been any major transitions lately? What's the emotional temperature in the house day to day? How are the parents functioning? Is the parent using drugs or abusing alcohol? Is the teen in school? And how is he or she doing there? Does the parent know what's happening with the youth school situation? And do they have any contact with the school? Are there learning or behavior problems at school? What are the parent's strengths? What are the adolescent's strengths? his or her developmental competencies. Although you'll never know the whole story, it's important to understand the teen's friendship network as best you can. Is the adolescent connected to an antisocial or drug-using peer culture? What about juvenile justice involvement? Has the youth been arrested? Is he or she currently on probation? What are the terms of the probation requirement? A substance use disorder with one or more co-occurring psychiatric disorders is known as a comorbidity. In clinical samples, this presentation is the rule rather than the exception. Evidence suggests that adolescent substance abuse in combination with psychiatric disorders is more challenging clinically than either problem alone. Teens with a dual diagnosis often have greater severity of family, school, and legal problems. These adolescents have worse treatment outcomes and are more than twice as costly to treat as their counterparts with no co-occurring disorder or teens with substance abuse or mental health problems in isolation. This presents a significant challenge in the juvenile justice system. Of the two million youth entering the juvenile justice system each year, 62.5% report alcohol and other drug problems and 75% also report mental health problems. And youth with co-occurring disorders are at high risk to drop out of treatment. There are three co-occurring disorders that most commonly appear with adolescents having substance abuse problems. They are conic disorder, affecting about 50 to 80% of the kids. Mood and anxiety disorders, affecting 25 to 50% and post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, which affects a high number of teens in urban areas. It's estimated that up to 25% of males and 75% of females with substance abuse suffer from PTSD. An integrative approach is required for kids with co-occurring problems, and clinicians must be prepared to work with other professionals. The cost of non-treatment can be severe and long-lasting. Teens often experience serious legal trouble before substance abuse and mental health treatment becomes available. It's vital to watch for warning signs of co-occurring disorders and begin an integrative treatment as soon as possible.